Welcome to Rowan Resource Podcast. This is Travis, and my guest today is Mike Irwin. Mike Irwin and I connected uh, while Mike was working with me at Essex Rowing Club in the early 2009-2010 period, I believe. Mm -hmm. Mike got a start rowing as a youth athlete at Detroit Boat Club and continued his career at Trinity College. Trinity is also where he began coaching at the invitation of his uh, former head coach, I believe. Correct. And uh, moved from there to Yale, where he coached with the freshman lightweights uh, for several years, and then moved to the freshman heavyweights. Uh, from the freshman heavyweights, Mike moved to the head lightweight position at University of Pennsylvania, where he coached for, I believe, eight? Seven years. Seven years. Yep. And then moved on to Essex, where he was for two and a half, three years, yep. I believe three years. And then from Essex Rowing Club, moved to St. Joe's and back in Philadelphia, where he has been currently. And so... Mike brings a wealth of experience uh, from a variety of different programs and the rarity of high-level college and, uh, and youth programs as well. And so we'll be diving into a little bit of that experience as we talk today. Mike, welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So there are things that you've achieved in your career that have really kind of you know, sparked my interest. And certainly my direct experience with you was at Essex where you came in very early in that program's history. You were the second men's coach during the second season of Essex, which was the third season actually that Essex was around because there was no varsity team our second year. Right. Uh, there were only three guys that year. And then the next year, Jay Bridges took over, and the S68 had gotten fifth at districts, and then we brought you on, and then proceeded, I believe it was third that next year, and then first the following year uh, with that men's varsity eight. Yep. And um, I know looking at that process from the outside, seeing a dramatic change both in the technical style of that crew, the culture of that crew, um, how they trained, and um, kind of how they thought of themselves. And that was a legacy that continued for several years. It was basically kind of a, a thumbprint that lasted for many years after. And seeing you from the outside also moving to St. Joe's University and having a very similar effect on that program of taking a program that was struggling at the time and bring it to the point where um, have been consistent contenders at the Dad Vale at, at, that, at that big mm -hmm. championship. Yep. Um, and so, you know, want to kind of let you off the leash to talk a little bit about that <laughs> process and kind of, you know, because there's so many coaches that come into these programs and elevating it, bring it to the next level, or even just kind of making that transition in culture um, and, and kind of execute on the vision, I think is something that a lot of people are interested in. Yeah. I, it, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot to cover there. And I, and I think you hit on one of the important ones that, I think we all recognize it when we've been at this a while is the the culture the environment of your boathouse your club your college program whatever it may be really sets the tone for your performances ultimately down the line sure it's easy to sort of say hey we coached boats that you know won this medal or this race or that thing um, but a number one that doesn't happen if you don't have good athletes you know, the old axiom that it's not so much that there's good coaches, there's good athletes, you know, mm -hmm. coaches that have good athletes. And, but I think what keeps those athletes getting up in the morning, if it's, you know, like we do now, it's, you know, six in the morning to come to the boathouse or, you know, coming in every evening late after a long day of school, what keeps those, you know, youth or collegiate athletes coming back is the environment that they're in and one that they want to be there. You know, they're not doing it necessarily because if I do this, I'm going to win a medal or I'm going to, I'm doing this because I enjoy this environment. I enjoy being challenged. I enjoy being an athlete and all the things that gives me success, failure, adversity, working with others, trying to find common ground with people to do something more than what you could do by yourself. I think that I've learned over time, that's the key to everything. If you can find and, and sort of set your dynamic in whatever your environment is and build it and grow it, that's, that's what gives you a sustainable model, you know, one that where you feel like you can kind of keep it going mm -hmm. um, versus, hey, we had this one year where we had a bunch of good athletes and then we just, all we cared about was them and we didn't care about the whole group and so you get that one performance but then things, as soon as they graduate or move on, it 
it, it's not repeated or it's not sustained or it's not handed down, it's not passed along to the next group about how to do things, how you, how you go about yourself. And I think that's really worth highlighting because I see it a lot with teams where there's this flash in the pan performance and then um, the program just kind of putters out for a while. And that I experienced that myself in my own career where early in my post-collegiate time, I was training with Malta Boat Club, which was a small group of male scholars, male lightweight scholars. And we were very successful in that training group, but I was looking for to move somewhere where I could get more experience in a larger environment where there was more selective pressure because having come from a small club program at University of Florida, um, I had kind of always uh, found it easy to rise to the top of that group because there just wasn't a lot of depth in terms of that speed. And I was looking at New York Athletic Club and the results that I've been seeing coming out of New York Athletic Club were, were very impressive. They're, they had been consistently performing well in the intermediate lightweight eight and putting out one or two boats that were uh, medal contenders or certainly finalists. And they were starting to focus on producing an elite eight as well. And so I made that transition to New York Athletic Club and, and what happened to coincide with that move was uh, the program had decided that it was going to turn its focus for that year on um, and this was a budget decision primarily, but it was it had gone from accepting anybody that could come and train in that program, and they decided that they just needed to kind of limit their expenses, and so they instead recruited a group of nine guys for their AMA program, and it ended up being a guys a lot of guys that were very strong on the erg, and I, I think we had like a six twenty seven erg average uh, for an intermediate lightweight eight, but um, we spent the whole summer essentially teaching those guys. How to row, and so the performance was a little bit um, below what it had been in previous years. Um, and at the same time, there was a lot of focus of the resources on developing that elite eight, and and they had produced a very successful elite eight um, at the world championship level. I, I believe they were second or third um, in those years. But that performance, and that and that second or third performance with the elite eight continued for a couple of years, but it dropped off precipitously after that because um, they had gone from essentially developing this very robust intermediate program that was that was then graduating athletes that could compete at that elite level and could contribute to their base pool of athletes for the elite eight and then when they stopped um, focusing on that larger pool of intermediate athletes there was this half-life you know that the intermediate eight had before um, they were no longer able to kind of build a base from their own intermediates and, and they were completely reliant upon um, non-New York athletes coming in um, to try out for that eight and it, and it didn't last very long after that. Um, but you see that with a lot of programs where they'll have a very successful novice program that builds into a, a successful varsity program and then the coach will turn their attention to that varsity team to the detriment of that of those novice athletes and then there's you know it, it will only last a year or two before suddenly the performance of that program drops off because the focus has been taken away from um developing the, the base of athletes you know developing those those uh, new novices um in the case of a, a high school or college program coming in in the same way that that new york had kind of drawn its attention from um developing the intermediate athletes in that level yeah, I mean, I mean, I think one of the things at Essex that was important, you know, at that time in building when the program was so new, and obviously, you know, we had to do this because of our limitations of staffing and equipment, but we were both working with both our novice groups and our, quote, varsity groups, our mm-hmm. upper groups. So I think the one of the big things there is we were able to, whatever our message was, whether it was technical in terms of the way we wanted people to row, whether it was cultural in terms of the way we wanted people to handle things and look at things and understand how to train or how to understand their bodies, mm-hmm. that message was getting implanted you know, right away in the younger athletes so that when they finally did move up, it wasn't seeing me or you wasn't a new thing. Oh, you're just with this 
other assistant coach all the time. Mm -hmm. um, it's both coach, you know, it's, we work with the entire coaching staff and then we work, you know, and I think there was, there was a lot to that that I learned in my short time at Essex that made me really reflect back on the collegiate model of varsity coach only coaches to the varsity, freshman coach only coaches to the freshman. And, you know, they have to spend a year and then they get to move up. And I think when you have coaches that are on the same page and they sort of integrate the freshman well, that, that would work. But we were all practicing at the same time, so it wasn't as if the varsity coach could really coach and spend any true hands-on time with the freshman. Um, and so when I got to St. Joe's, one of the things I, I realized with the walk-ons and novices we were trying to develop or even sort of maybe the low-level experience guys out of high school is our, while our normal practice routine is in the morning our novice group was in the afternoon and that allowed and because I had to I didn't have the coaching staff to run four or five eights of guys all together in the morning mm -hmm. we could run two or three in the morning with two coaches and then we'd come back in the afternoon and both work with the same group and you know, again, it was that was kind of trying to carry over things I learned at Essex to say it's really important if I want to develop these athletes that, yeah, right now, in the first year or two, they're not really going to have an impact so much on the top end of the team. But, you know, in their third and fourth year, they're really going to and that and that 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 was something that really helped has helped me tremendously where I am now. And I think helped, you know, Essex in those years because, you know, kids were coming back, you know, they did it you know, as a novice year or just trying it out and then, but they realized they were part of something bigger and they wanted to come back and they wanted to be in the big boats. They didn't want to make it necessarily all about themselves. So they wanted to be part of the group. So that, you know, that sense of team, that sense of belonging, you know, that's obviously also unique to rowing when we have eights and fours in big boats, you know, where you definitely feel like it's not just, you know, I think even though I do enjoy rowing the single, I think sort of competing the single is tough. It takes a really unique mindset to sort of just drive yourself all the time in your own boat, you know, versus I'm getting in a boat with two, three, four, seven other people, and I'm, I'm trying to find my limit, push as hard as I can because I don't want to let the other people down. I want to help, you know, I want to be part of the group. I want to sort of give my share. Um, and that's what always made it really enjoyable for me. So it was sort of trying to maybe take my own experience in athletics and in rowing in particular and feed that into my coaching in terms of how to develop, coach, motivate young athletes. Right. And I think that, you know, so much of what I was doing at Essex was kind of experimentation as well and trying new things based on the resource we had available. And I, that early model that came from necessity as well as something that I thought was kind of important. I, and I remember talking about that when we sat down um, to talk about you joining Essex was that idea of coaching the novice and the varsity mm -hmm. of having that consistency there. And that's always been something that I've enjoyed for me, you know, as well because I'm look, when I'm coaching athlete, I try to look at it well beyond that one year period, right? I'm trying to look at it that four years and there is a periodization of, technical and psychological and and physiological training that goes in, into that process and yeah. having control of that you know I think is is very important and in the later years where a lot of those times started to shift based on who we had available on staff and kind of based switching times around or, or as various schools that we happen to be drawing from a lot of that time were changing their release times and making it harder for those groups and saying okay well maybe we have to move this and so that all the boys are practicing at one time, all the girls are practicing at another. And also experiments with, with trying to keep them practicing at the same time to have almost kind of like a gender community, yep. you know, for yep. that and make sure. it easier for, you know, certainly at the youth level where you you are gonna be missing people on a regular basis because you right. don't have that that control of right. the, 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 the practice attendance that you do in college of, of allowing some easy mobility between the novice team, varsity team to, to let them interact. But I think through that experience, it was very clear over time and, and certainly having learned from mistakes that the, that the most successful model was always trying to get that, that head coach working as the head from the novice to the varsity level and then have that support staff you know, also be consistent you know, 
the support staff, the assistant that's at the head is the assistant and novice and, and having that cohesion rather than just trying to keep all the girls at a time, all the boys at a time. Yeah, and, I, and I think what you and I talked about it at times was that philosophy of your best coach or really your most experienced coach working with your least experienced athletes. Definitely. Because that, in theory, should get the most out of that group mm -hmm. versus having a new, young, very inexperienced coach working with your inexperienced athletes on some levels. Yes, putting that coach with an experienced group, they may not be able to you know, kind of manage, coach, or whatever that group. But in a lot of ways, um, you needed to have your most experienced coach with your least experienced athletes. You also obviously needed to have a way to develop your young coaches, and they weren't going to do that necessarily if they're always by themselves. Right. You know, that they kind of needed to kind of watch and see and be around hands-on with your more experienced coaches for things to be able to translate and rub off and, and all those good things. And But I do think that, out there in the coaching world, there is perhaps sometimes the mentality of, well, I've already put in my dues coaching novices mm -hmm. for, you yeah. know, and whether it's, you know, a year or, you know, however many more, it's like, I've already put in my dues. So now I want to coach the, I want to coach the varsity. I want to coach the advanced boats. Right. And, and there isn't that patience for teaching, mm -hmm. you know, to really sort of break down and really have to because I think, to be quite honest, as a coach, every time you have novices, it really makes you think about, well, how do I explain this? How do I constantly break it down back into, you know, skill, teaching skills, skill breakdown, teaching culture from scratch, all those things. Because I think probably if we get away from that, like I feel like as a coach, I will probably stop, I'll lose sight of the fundamentals if I stop coaching novices. Right. And I don't ever want to, do that because I think that that's when I'll start to get stale, flat, whatever, however you want to say it as a coach and not remember those things that you, you know, every year you sort of, you know, chuckle at the, you know, the novice that puts their oar in backwards or that, you know, they do the things and you just have to go through that. You have to be patient. I think it's, it's part of the process. And to be quite honest, like there's nothing more rewarding to me than, you know, getting to the end of a season or a thing and watching that person who, you know, it was all they could do to just sit in a boat you know, for the first month or two to watch them go out and do something really spectacular on the water or kind of break through a new performance goal on the machine or whatever it is. And, and they're so excited when they get to that, you know, that's infectious to me. That's what you, where you go, yes, this is why I do this, right? right. This is why I've, I've chosen this as my career because, you know, you and I both know we don't do it because we get awesome signing bonuses right. and, you know, endorsement deals from Nike, right? We do it because... Um, it's something we're passionate about. It's something that we find tremendously rewarding. And, you know, it's the reward is watching those athletes grow mm -hmm. and develop. And from, you know, and for some, you know, from, from ground zero. Like, I've never heard of this thing before. This is my first time at the river, but somebody dragged me down here. And, okay, great. Yeah. Here's an oar. Here's a boat. This is what the motion is supposed to look like. And you start, you know, and you start from scratch. And I think that... It's just, again, I find it for me, I think, again, there are a lot of coaches that don't have the patience for that, don't want to have to slow things down like that and kind of start from scratch. Um, but, you know, I'm still going to always be working with my more experienced group. That'll never go away, right? So, but to be able to go back every year and work with a new group and see what we get. You know, I always say to my college athletes, there's always one, you know, especially the experienced freshmen that come in every year that, you know, some of them think they're, you know, awesome, you know, you know, they're God's gift or something to, to rowing. And you're like, okay, you know, I said, but listen, I'm going to find one. And like, what do you mean? I was like, there's always one. There's always one novice that we're going to find that's going to do just give me a year and they're going to be stroke for stroke, stride for stride with you in oh, training and competing. Yeah. There's always one. And they're sort of looking at me. And I was like, this is important. It's important that you guys understand and reach out. Someone taught you along the way you didn't get here without help you right. just happened to have started it maybe in high school yeah so you know as a college coach for most of my life you know sort of that mentality and culture of you know if we find good athletes we can teach them how to row mm -hmm. and yeah. the um i think that uh, the appreciation from the varsity of looking at those novices as the best future 
but also, like you said, in terms of appreciating the speed, because I think there's so there's an idea that the varsity should be faster than novice, and and there's going to be truth to that on the water because of the skill level, but certainly in terms of power production, athleticism, that it, you know, if you're looking at your speed scale from a zero to 100 percent, 100 being your fastest, then those novices really should be, you know, those top novices should be pushing into that 15, 10 percent by the end of that first year, you know, with kind of the the average of the novice is skewing a little lower, hopefully, than the average of the varsity. But, you know, if you're, and you're seeing those speed. And then also, I think it's to have an understanding for those athletes of what fast is, you know, mm-hmm. is going to be important if there's if there's that coach that's there with both and saying, well, this is what the varsity doing, this is what you can do. And, right. and also coming with that ability of, like, there's no reason you can't be doing that just because of varsity. Like, if they're applying... 90% of their power on the water in the varsity because they have a skill and you're applying 60 because you're novice, that's a different thing. Right. But on the erg, you know, this is athleticism. You know, these people haven't been rowing since they were five, six years old. And so, you know, a lot of us are getting into it. And so there's no reason that athleticism, that power production can't be apparent very early in the, in the career. Yeah. And, it, you know, it's, it's, it's fun, too, to be able to sort of take that novice athlete that you know you can watch them pretty quickly and identify who has some athleticism and you know you're just trying to sort of encourage and fuel their interest in a new sport and you know they're going through the normal bumps and bruises of figuring things out for the first time and being frustrated maybe that they can't get it right away and they're not more they don't feel more coordinated or whatever it is and then you know you expose them to seeing the varsity row by or train on the erg or whatever and then you point out and you say see you know Jim over there on the third erg in and they're like yeah and they're like oh he's pretty good and I was like right he was you three years ago Mm -hmm. he was a complete novice he had no idea he was a you know a wrestler in high school and had no idea what rowing was you know but this is the story that got him down to the boathouse for the first time and he stuck with it and you know here he is go talk to him you know he'll tell you a story he'll Mm -hmm. tell you he'll tell you kind of what it was that that stuck with him how he caught the bug why it's you know, how he got to where he is, you know, I mean, three out of my, three of the four captains for my program at St. Joe's in the last four years are walk-ons. And our, the way we do captains is it's elected by the team. We have a process, but the team sits down and sort of selects their criteria for our captain and then they vote on, you know, candidates. So it's, it's not captains that I chose, you know, it's captains that that they chose that had those qualities and had the work ethic and all those things. And so, you know, having, you know, feeling, you know, good about our development over the last three or four years and knowing that the people that the team recognized as the leaders and wanted as the leaders were guys that had had no idea about rowing. They all walked onto the team as freshmen in college. Just goes to show you, you know, there's, there's actually more than one, (laughs) you know, that's, there's, um, you know, and again, I think this gets back down to where we started about culture, about an environment, about, you know, and that's for a lot of the guys that I talked to it was I was an athlete in high school or I was involved in things, but I really wanted to do something in college where I had this sort of active outlet. I could compete. I didn't mind working hard. I wanted to be in a group environment and an organized one, a varsity, you know, kind of organized environment and that's what drew them you know we were active getting out there and saying we're looking for people that have this mindset that have this sort of idea of who they are and we're gonna it just happens to be rowing but it's you know they could have channeled it into anything we just mm-hmm. happened to get them to channel it into rowing and what you know in terms of what you're looking for in that culture you know are there characteristics that you think you know are defining that kind of help stand out in my experience, one thing that we talked a lot about was trying to redefine hierarchy within the athletic system, both based on what might be common in other sports or just in culture, and you know, with particular emphasis on ideas of seniority, age-based seniority, or even experience-based seniority. You know, we've had lots of conversations with my athletes about any deference or respect should be drawn purely from that athlete's commitment to their training you know, are they there? Are they putting that time in that there wasn't, nobody cared if you had been rowing for four years, nobody cared if you were a senior, you know, if there were, if there was this eighth grader that was moving faster than this 11th grader, then the respect came with that. And there wasn't the sense of you're this person or that. And I think 
you know, another thing when you, we, when you do have that cohesive coaching between the novice and the varsity, there isn't an us versus them that inevitably kind of develops, you know, this tribalistic mentality that's, yeah. you know, human nature. But you get, you know, that sense of, okay, well, we're going to respect everybody. We don't care whether you just started or not, you know, that, uh, you know, and I found that that would get rid of a lot of kind of toxicity and also, I guess, this empty prestige that sometimes would come in the team and interfere with the ability of athletes to focus or more importantly to collaborate with each other and mentor each other to move forward because it wasn't this like I'm I'm in this group and you're in that group because I'm more experienced or you're not and with high school kids that's very apparent at yeah. school and it was hard to get that out of the, the team environment yeah it, you know, this is culturally this is one of the things that having been a long time college freshman coach where the freshman rules were in place at the time the different leagues to say when you're a freshman whether you've rowed in high school or not you have to row in the freshman boats you can't move up to the varsity now there was sort of the good and bad in that the, the good was the experienced athletes realized okay I don't I, I don't have the option of moving up to the more experienced group and so my classmates my age just like me just got here in their first year these are the people that I'm going to either be successful or not with right and so if I think you know they take the cue from coaches if we value novices and teaching them and being patient and, and having the experience group help us teach those novices and understand that and realize that yes we're slowing things down now so that we can get farther later um, <clears throat> that's important in building that class but then what you're missing is the ability to connect that class to the other three classes and there would i think at times you know be that mentality of okay we're the upperclassmen you're freshmen you don't get to row with us you know see us in a year you it's almost like you know initiation into a fraternity you're just a pledge you know for a year and then you know if you survive then we might you know, say hi to you and pay attention, right? So I, de I definitely felt there were times with teams where you just, you couldn't create that connection as, as deeply as you would have liked if you could have integrated everybody right away. Now, there were ways around that, you know, like, hey, you got the winter training time when everyone's basically doing the same thing. <clears throat> you know, you mix the groups mm -hmm. and you're side by side and you're working and sweating and pushing together. There were ways to sort of get the upperclassmen to start to know the young guys and, and be encouraging to their success and even though yeah we can't row with you whatever like we want you to succeed we're going to help you any way we can i mean i think there are ways to you know you would do that but you know i also knew that there were programs out there that would be like the varsity would only practice in the morning the freshmen would only practice in the afternoon and it would be that way all year and they'd never see each other so then when they moved up as sophomores they'd be like well, who are these guys mm -hmm. you'd spent your whole first year <clears throat> yes getting to know them but they weren't getting to know the rest of the team. So your culture was a little bit fragmented. Um, and so I think that, you know, again, that, that ability then when we got to me, one of the great things about getting rid of the freshman rule was you, you fit in where, where your skill set puts you. If you're good enough to be in the top boat, then that's eventually where you're going to be. If you're in the second boat, you're second boat. And then, <clears throat> you know, we're just, Hey, we're a roster of, 40 or 50 athletes and the bottom line is if we want to have a successful top boat then we need a second boat to train alongside them and push them if we want to have a successful second boat then we need a third boat to sort of be able to train alongside and push them and so on down the line and and then the philosophy is everyone counts mm -hmm. it doesn't matter whether your erg score is here or here <clears throat> everyone counts because it's all about creating that internal environment <coughs> excuse me on a daily basis where we're pushing one another and trying to figure out how far we can go. That's it. It's not because you're, you know, you're special and you're going to go do your special training over here and then we're going to do it's all about to me trying to create that group environment. And yes, the younger guys, less development guys, you know, in the first year then they might be a little bit wide-eyed and maybe not completely comfortable in their own skin, but that's just development. It mm -hmm. happens you know anywhere. But I think sort of there's that, you know, deeper sense of building sort of team continuity and, and building that sense of we're all in this together. And so, you know, when you said initially, like, what are you looking for? And I, you know, get that 
question a lot in the recruiting process. And, you know, it's, and they're saying anything from like, what urge scores are you looking for? Or what this are you looking for? And I'm always like, well, listen, like, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for people that like to be athletes. I'm looking for people that like to compete. And I'm looking for guys that don't mind a little bit of hard work. That's it. I don't care whether you're, you know, six feet tall or five feet tall. I don't care whether you're this size or that size. I don't care where your erg is right now or this. Sure, we want everything to be faster. We want you to be really fit. But the bottom line is, if you think what we do and what we're telling you about what we do resonates with you, then all right, come on, come on board, let's go. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna and we're gonna develop you over four years. You're gonna start somewhere, but we're gonna just make sure you finish somewhere a lot better. Mm -hmm. And and I know that that's not necessarily a common philosophy out there, meaning that there are a lot of coaches that say, listen, we have a cutoff. We're only gonna take this size. We're only gonna take this ERG score. And we're only looking for this experience. We don't want novices. We don't wanna be bothered teaching. And again, everybody's, I, I, listen, we don't all have to be the same. It's just philosophically not what I believe in as a coach um, and what I think works for who I am and how I like to go about things. Like we want novices. We want to create that environment. We want to find the people that you know, might look at and you go, all right, that's not necessarily the prototypical or the you know, ideal if you could make it out of scratch, you know, rowing body. But wow, you put that person in a boat, you put them on the machine and you watch them work and you see how hard they go and you're like, I'll take that every day. You know, yeah, I, mean? I think that... Take that person on my team every day. That That's so absent, I think, in the recruiting. I think there's a deficiency in recruiting, you know, and it's 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 certainly harder from the high school because you're not, you're, you're bringing in people that are new, you know, for the most part, unless you're bringing in athletes from other sports, in which case that's, that's an advantage. But with college coaches that are recruiting, I just felt like that was, it was the wrong approach for them to be so focused on, on the, the numbers of the, the ERG score and the mm -hmm. height and weight and that there just wasn't enough in-depth conversations there to kind of, you know, figure out well, what's the mentality this person is bringing in. And, you know, for me, it, it seemed like, you know, if I'm going into this college recruiting, you know, scenario that, I think that the that the trick for those coaches is to really start looking at these kind of underdeveloped programs and finding kind of like the best, you know, the big athletes in that small pond, and if they can find those athletes, because you know anyone that's rising to the top, whatever group, they're they're working well within the system that's available to them, and if those colleges can just right. say, I know you can be successful in an in an environment that's being provided. <laughs> But the environment you've been provided is not ideal for your development. Let's bring you into this new environment and let's give you more resources. But that work ethic and that psychology is going to transfer easily and those athletes are probably going to thrive. Whereas I think that so many coaches are just focused on bring, looking at the best programs and bringing in athletes from those programs, even if it's kind of a mid-tier athlete within that top program. I feel like that, that athlete might have way less potential than a top program athlete that's underperforming in <laughs> right. a successful program um but again that bringing that back to the idea of the the psychology of the athlete is difficult to train if not impossible and a pet peeve that i have just with coaches in general is when coaches will talk about making their athletes tougher it's like i got this workout you know my, my athletes are really kind of soft and they're struggling in this third 500 or whatever it is and but i have this workout that's going to really get past that it's going to push <laughs> them really hard right. and i've been i've been in rowing for a long time i've been coaching for a long time i have yet to see a soft athlete become hard because of a workout or even i think it's difficult for that for that athlete that struggles psychologically to get past that hump in the first place and become tougher in general um, and so recruiting that, that psychological strength, I think is key. And if you can find that in an athlete that just hasn't reached their potential yet is important. But then, and going back to, you know, when there are training, those athletes that are, that are struggling psychologically, you know, the worst thing you can do with that athlete is throw on this crazy workload, right? The best thing you can do is very surgically 
train them and, and enable them by increasing that fitness, by putting them in a place to be successful, and then allowing them to consistently set new levels, standards of performance yeah. for themselves. And then as you do that, then their confidence is going to yeah. come. Yeah. Then as the confidence come, that's when they're going to get tougher. And it's, and it's a several year long process. Yes. Right. It's not, it's not mm-hmm. quick. You're definitely not going to do it by saying, you know, we're doing 16,500 meters today, you know, and you only get two or three minutes of rest, you know, that that's never going to make it even tougher. Um, but if you, if you can, if you get to know that athlete and that's something that it goes back to the advantage of, of working with the athlete from the novice to the varsity is that you can, you can see an athlete that might have that potential, but their weakness is that confidence or that ability to kind of push through the adversity of training and, and if you are patient you're like well I know you know this athlete in four years can be a 1D athlete and I'm going to invest in kind of trying to get them faster by slowly progressing them and not kind of putting in position to fail but consistently succeed in very small measures and using the sum of the success to <laughs> yeah and I well I think there's the right it's so okay you say okay guys we're not tough enough and we're gonna do this workout and this is gonna make us tougher. Now, again, you if you have an ath- you know, a group of 20, 30, 40, you know, whatever it is, athletes, some of them are gonna be by definition already, you know, pretty tough. But they've learned it along the way somewhere, right? Mm-hmm. It didn't just happen and they've they figured it out along the way somewhere. And some some athletes are still trying to figure out just that confidence or consistency to be tougher in whatever the challenge is. But I think if you tell them right away that like, okay, well, we're not being tough enough. Some guys are going to be of that mentality, like the I'll show you mentality, but that's sort of a small group. And then there'll be a lot of, well, I'm not, you know, those yeah. to sort of yeah. doubt, doubt themselves. So, you know, coach is telling me I'm not. And I thought I was, I thought I was doing okay for me. And, and when in reality, probably for them, they are doing really okay. Yeah. Right. You know, that that's sort of who they are and where they are now. I think it's, Better to say with that workout that you know is a challenging and tough workout to say, listen, there are certain workouts I'm going to give you where the idea is to try and see if you can't get you out of your comfort zone. To see if we can't get you to do a little bit more than what you think you can do. So now it's looked at as just a general challenge for everybody, right? Like you're here and we want to get you, the idea is always, can we get you somewhere further than when you're, can you be better today than you were yesterday? Can you be better next week than you were this week? Can you, can we find a little bit more? And, and I think the key word there is little. Yeah. Is little, right? right? Is, is trying to make little changes yeah. um, along the way. Yeah, and, and there are guys, that, and you know, you and I have seen this over the years. You have guys, so there are certain workouts you do, and you go, okay, when we do short interval type stuff, this person's fine. They can be in attack mode and do the things that you want a competitive athlete to do. And then maybe you get into some longer stuff where you're saying, hey, we're doing, you know, 3 by 4 k we're doing 3 by 20 and they just... They don't have the mental skill set to stay on top of it. So you watch their numbers or you watch them go through that work and you realize that they just, they wander and there's moments where it's not as consistent and you, you know, and that's where you kind of learn a little bit about who they are and where they are in that development process of, you know, being able to, you know, kind of understand how their body's going to react in longer stuff. How do I then figure out how to keep myself, you know, mentally dialed in on the task at hand? And how do I maybe watch my numbers? And how do we do some things to sort of make it, you know, positive reinforcing versus, all right, I'm not, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And then they kind of get in their own, you know, headspace in a bad way where, you know, they got to, you know, so you just see the, you know, air come out of the balloon kind of thing. Um, and I, I, I certainly don't feel like I've, you know, figured that all out. You know, I feel like every, every athlete has its own unique challenge on that. Everybody's a little bit different, you know, in terms of when they learn, how they learn. And that's the fun part about being a coach. You're like, okay, well, this one's a little bit different. How do I connect with Jim in a way that was different than Tom? Or how do I get to Sue that's different than, you know... Yes, we're working on the same general concepts. When I did this, it helped Sue, but when I do it this way, this is going to help Julie do this. You know, and it's just 
finding those subtleties that come with time as a coach, you know, and, you know, realizing that, sure, you might say something one way that works for 50% of your athletes, and then you got to figure out another way to say it for the other 20% in another way. Right. Um, but you, I, I do think I've always tried to kind of start to come at things from a, you don't know what you're capable of, right? There's no way that you, any of you have been involved, especially as an endurance athletes. There's no way you've had put in enough time or really had enough experience to know what your body's truly capable of. Mm -hmm. So the idea here is how do we figure out how to get to new territory, right? Mm -hmm. There's no ceiling. There's no cap on what you can do. Yeah, there might be, it might be unrealistic to think we can get, you know, X far in six months. You know what I mean? But again, there's always room to grow. There's always room to improve when you have young athletes like that. The question is how much? Yeah. That's to me, that's the fun part. Like, well, how much? I don't know. Let's mm -hmm. go find out. Yeah. Right. As opposed to saying, well, you can only do this or you're not tough enough. And so we're going to do this toughening up workout. Sort of like, listen, we're doing things to see if we can't, like, how, what are you really capable of? Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I try and keep reinforcing that theme to sort of make it what I think is more engaging, you know, and learning about being an endurance athlete, being a varsity athlete, like, well, what am I really capable of? Like, okay, I'm surrounding myself with a group of people. Like we're all trying to figure out what can we really do? Yeah. That's fun. That, that you get up out of bed for every morning to kind of figure out, Hey, can we be a little bit more today than we were yesterday? Can we do a little bit more? And we can, we all know we can. You know, and it's, uh, and then how do we challenge, how do we handle the challenges that come at us? Because we know they're going to come. You get sick, you get injured, you, you know, it's frozen weather for two weeks. We don't get on the water as much as we want. Like they're going to come. We just don't know what they are. And when we get them, instead of saying, oh no, it's terrible that it happened. It's like, this is one of the, this is one of those moments that we know is coming where we're going to be challenged to sort of persevere and kind of stay mentally positive this is just one of them mm -hmm. there's going to be however many over the course of the year this is normal right versus uh, you know so and so got hurt or how are we going to replace that person no this is why we have the big group someone's ready to right and this is why we do things together so that if we move someone up or back or around or whatever they know what's going on mm -hmm. they're not completely isolated or been in the different and they don't have no idea what's going on like we're ready to yeah, and I found, you know, for if you can give them a more diverse, I guess, um, repertoire of benchmarks that they can use yeah. to track that success, that that's critical. And I think that it's, it's this huge pitfall to focus on speed splits as that only measure of progress. And you're saying, like, we're constantly figuring out what our limits are and, you know, for me, you know, my athletes were, we had lots of conversations about the importance of keeping that training log to, to, and it wasn't just, this is the workout I did, this was my splits, like keep all that information, not only for just kind of keeping track of your life and trying to see if you have a plateau of what might be contributed to it, but also for them, for that self-motivation and tracking, because, you know, if we were going and we were saying, all right, our goal is to be getting better every day, and they're only looking at that split that there are, there are inevitable times in your career where that split is going to maintain constant. And that may be because you hit a plateau, but it also may be because you're, you're making improvements in other dimensions. And so, right. you know, if you're, if you're talking to those athletes and you're saying, you know, let's use, if we use a steady state, you know, as you know, a 60 minute steady state as, as a benchmark of improving fitness. And that person is like, well, you know, I've been pulling a 156, you know, on my steady state and I just can't get, can't get down to 155 and this. And whereas if you had gone back and you're like, okay, well, we're, we're doing this 155, you know, our steady state, we were doing it, you know, for 45 minutes before at this split, you know, at this 20 stroke rate and we're getting this 155. Well, now you're going for 60 minutes at this 20 stroke rate at 155. And so, okay. Well, I've improved in terms of my ability to sustain that, you know, or if you're like, okay, well then I get to that 60 minutes, I'm 155, 20 stroke rates. And then six months later, well, I only need to row an 18 to hold that 155 for 60 minutes now. And so, you, you know, if you kind of open it up to them to look at, it's not always about that split, <laughs> you know, it could be about, you know, increasing the capacity for the work. It could be increasing the right. efficiency, 
you know, through stroke rate of what you need for the work and that, um, and that helps in terms of getting them that, that sense that they are improving and they're all finding new limits, you know, and if they are just focused on this one benchmark of that improvement, it's easier for them to get, get unmotivated. And then they start to lose confidence in themselves, yeah. the environment, you know, the coach, you know, whereas if they're like, oh, well, you know, I've improved this, I've improved that, you know, in this time, I think that that's, that's critical for maintaining that motivation. Yeah. And I, I I think you remember this, but my background, my academic background is in engineering, in mechanical engineering. And so numbers, you know, working in Excel and tracking splits and and writing workouts and, you know, having pace charts and things like that. There's a lot of stuff that I truly love about that. And my mind is always being geared towards stuff like that. And yet when it comes to... You know, especially being a long-time collegiate coach and everything is about, you know, eights. You know, to me, ultimately, when it comes down to having successful boats, it's finding those combinations that click and, and then how they race, how they, you know, combinations that, you know, just sort of start to click and work together and then sort of build sort of that just confidence and momentum to go out and just not think and not be assessed about a number and just go and just be an athlete, right? Mm -hmm. Just race. And, and, and so while I might be more, for lack of a better way, you know, kind of numbers oriented at certain times of year or even, you know, sort of in certain workouts, there's so much that we do on a regular basis. That's really just about how's the boat motor? How are you, integrating with the guys around you how are you working together it has nothing to do with splits or you know i have to do this or I have to do that it's just mm-hmm. you know and really just trying to figure that <clears throat> piece out and you know sort of the art of rowing versus the science of rowing yeah you know, for lack of a better way of saying it and um you know and so to me that's sort of finding the balance between sort of my number side and what i know is also that really important side of you know team boats which is when you find that chemistry those combinations that work like you can't quantify it right you can't there's no like if i have this guy with this error score and this guy with this height and i put them all on this exact lineup it's going to go fast Mm -hmm. you just don't know until you kind of figure it out and you don't really know until you start putting them on the line against someone else that they don't know even as hard as we might try to sort of recreate those experiences in practice with multiple boats and <laughs> you know making even lineups as best you can and trying to push them you know there's nothing that replaces that experience of lining up against the unknown and trying to get from you know point a to point b as fast as you can and that's where they really start to learn you start to really learn what what they have how they can handle you know composure and all those things that again have nothing to do with steady state scores are what you know where mm. they realize that sure the numbers are important, and for me, only in the sense of <laughs> they start to teach me about your composure and consistency. Like it's part of your body of work. It's a it's one way to quantify. It's the nice thing about the art, right? If we can kind of quantify where, hey, maybe it's a focus issue, maybe it is really a strength issue, maybe it really is an endurance or fitness issue. And how do we help athletes when they say, "What can I do better?" And you can say, "Well, hey, we need to work on being better here." And so you can quantify that, but you know, ultimately sometimes, you know, what, what makes a difference between, let's say a fast, com- <laughs> fast combination or not is something that's very subjective. It's very, you have to kind of, you know, to me over time, it's just sort of instinct now, right? Like what I think is going to work and I'm, you know, I definitely still don't get it right, but I feel like give me enough time and a group of athletes that I know have you know, done their homework, so to speak, and kind of gotten their bodies ready to race at a high level. Okay, now we got a group that we can kind of mix and match with and kind of, and, and figure it out. Now that, like, I'd really be interested in kind of diving into particulars, kind of like case study, you mm. know, because I've watched from the outside and, and we can talk, we can talk about Essex because those guys are farther out. Maybe you don't have to talk about sure. current active athletes, but 
you know, I saw a lot of strategies that you used from the outside. I, I never got the chance to work with you. Know, <laughs> Carl, Carl had that benefit. Yeah. Um, and so it was really cool to look and we had a lot of chance to talk about it when we were working together. But, you know, can you dive into kind of the specifics, whether it was, you know, you, you, you would use a lot of even lineups, you would do a lot of rowing by sixes, yep. you would yep. move those lineups a lot, yep. things that, um, most coaches don't want to do because they were focused on the end game. And especially, right. you know, two of the things that really struck and that I used when I, when I did come in and have to take the varsity boys for a while and they were coming from a rough spot was rowing by sixes and rowing in mixed lineups, you know, and, and the, it took a while to sell those guys on those ideas, mm -hmm. but when they started to realize the benefits. And so, you know, talk about why you did that you know, specifically sure. how it worked and, sure. and why, you know, it can help a lot of the teams out there. Um, there's sort of a couple ways to come at this. One is sort of the, let's say the pure, let's say just technical side of things when you talk about rowing by sixes. And yeah, I'm not, I'm not a person, especially when I'm coaching big boats, you know, even if it's fours or, you know, even actually I was just out a couple days ago running a private lesson for, a master's double where they're and I was like well what's your normal routine and they're like well we just go off the dock and we roll a lot in our singles and we get in the double we just get off and we just row as a double and we do these drills and everything's double 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 and I'm mm -hmm. like well why don't you ever row one at a time and they're like well we do that in the single I was like well right but if you're rowing a single in the double right you're rowing your coxed single you get a chance to do things in a very stable platform that you don't get to do when you're rowing the single all by yourself right. and even though on some level we want you to not have your training wheels on and learn how to balance things. It is nice to go back to the fundamentals and work and reinforce your fundamentals by having someone set the boat up for you and you can do some things and kind of relax and work on some things and do some things and really dial in on your own rowing when you have help. I said, and the other piece of that is for the person that's not rowing, you're paying attention to how your partner is doing things. You should be, or I want you to. <laughs> so I want you to pay attention to her and when he's rowing what you pitch him so that when we go back to doing stuff by double and we started doing a lot of stuff where it was like single single double for a little bit break it back down single single double and kind of keep kind of going through different drill sequences and just variations of the same theme so that they started to kind of come to the middle and find the common ground of how to move the boat together mm -hmm. because it was clear they were just kind of jumping in the boat rowing you know both rowing at the same time and it was almost like well Either he's going to change to fit me or I've got to change to fit him. But there was no sense of trying to find the middle. It was just, well, I row this way and he doesn't match up with me. Or I row this way and she doesn't match up with me. And I'm sort of... So again, from that technical standpoint of trying to get kind of group dynamic going, I was like, well, listen, why don't you start thinking about your warm up this way? <laughs> it's a way to sort of build into your everyday process of how to work together. And yes, maybe on race day... When you're limited on warm-up time, you jump off the dock, you don't need to do that, you jump right in because you've spent all this time yeah. going back to your fundamentals, the way you move, the way you create rhythm together, the way that you create your, you know, and, and you're always breaking it down and building it up, breaking it down, building it up. So taking that now to big boat stuff. So to me, working sixes all the time, all year long, it's just stable platform, when we're rotating pairs, I'm always talking about, listen, you know, you know, uh, smooth transition in, smooth transition out. Be aware of how the boat's moving underneath you as you add in, add out. Um, you know, things where if they're not rowing for a little bit, they can even pay attention to how the rest of the boat's rowing, mm -hmm. right? Versus just spacing out and looking at the, you know, the birds, which of course happens. But, you know, you try and remind them <laughs> not to do that or try and actually learn something while they're sitting out. Um so, and just not, not being afraid to continually go back to the fundamentals. And I do think, you know, again, I think you're right. Coaches get impatient. They want to skip that stuff or they think, well, once I've done a certain amount of it or now this is a varsity boat, they don't need to do that stuff. And, you know, and this is where too, to be quite honest, it's like <laughs> all my time in the summers, being allowed to come and observe the national team and, and be the boatman and just be around those athletes. That's what they do. Drill work, fundamentals. It's not, there's nothing magical about what they're doing 
aside from the fact that they are gifted athletes, really like develop gifted at meaning they've really developed a certain level that you realize is you know special to be at that level at the Olympic level, but <clears throat> they do drill work and square blade and sixes like everybody else. It's not it's not as if there's all of a sudden a whole different set of drills or process for elite level athletes <clears throat> that people aren't doing with novices, high school, college, whatever it is. Like it's the same stuff. Okay, are they doing it at a slightly higher level? Yes. Are they a little bit more skilled and refined at it? Yes. But it's still the same pause drills. Yeah. And so again, like to me, like, you know, spending time sixes, stable platform. And so it's an outdoor rowing tank. I would make that joke, I think, a lot with guys, you know, especially like early in the year. I'm like, we're not going rowing. We're going to the outdoor tank. <laughs> right? right? You know, so that <laughs> Hey, we're not going to go out there and, okay, doing pieces, race, 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 bomb up and down the river, going crazy. Like, we're going out to learn how to row. Just move the boat. Move the boat a little bit better. Be a little bit more clean. Like, just... And and so I think, you know, part of it for me over time now is guys are used to the way I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. So they don't... Um, it's normal. But so... There's that, and then there's, I think, as we get more into that actual selection and, and even boat stuff, again, the way I look at it is I can't have a fast varsity if I don't have a JV that can be kind of right alongside. And it doesn't necessarily mean everyone's got to be at the same urge for or anything like that. It's just I feel like I'm going to have a better varsity if I have someone alongside because I do think that a big part of what we're trying to teach them is how to have composure, how to move the boat well, while not getting distracted or kind of getting by someone beside them. And if you row them alone all the time, people beside them racing you, whatever, it gets a little bit, it, there's a tension to that that you just don't want to have. So yeah. when they get used to just, okay, you're together, stride for stride. And I make, I'll, I'll make the analogy all the time. It's like, imagine you're going for a run and you're running with your buddy or a couple of buddies. Like you run together. Now granted, there's sometimes you race and someone's ahead and someone's behind, but it's like you try and just get into a, a you know, that sort of, if you can, maybe even a little bit of a conversational pace, but still a good run. And okay, maybe someone's got to look work a little bit harder to kind of keep up with the group than someone else who can, but you're all within the thing and you're just going out for a nice run together. And you're not trying to, you know, sort of in a lot of, sort of doing a lot of stuff. It's like, listen, you're not, you're not trying to constantly be four feet ahead of your person that your friend that you said, let's go for, a, you right. know, a five mile jog with, right? You know, where you sort of, you're being, you know, you know, you're sort of, you know, trying to kind of annoy them, right? Yeah. You, you know, you like run with them. Okay, throttle back maybe just a little bit. Find your, like allow them to kind of be with you. And then over time, like their skill set and their ability to create will sort of elevate so that all of a sudden now you're a lot closer than you were before. Mm -hmm. um, I'll actually, through a majority of my spring season, you know, if I'm getting ready for a championship, let's say in the middle of May, I mean, we'll, we'll row in even lineups, you know, almost right up to the first race. A couple days before we split in the lineups next week, we might have a race next week. We might not right back to even lineups because a, a, and a lot of time too, like I don't, I don't want guys to necessarily get comfortable in seats. I want to keep creating different combinations and dynamics and you know, it's, hey, we got this boat or these guys kind of rowing well, and now I want to move this group behind these guys to get them rowing a little bit more like them. And then we want to see if we can't, well, what happens if we put the stern four versus the bow four and then back them up, and then can we get two even boats, right? They're not even. Let's make some switches. Let's see what happens. It's not seat racing more than, it's it's not so much seat racing as, you know, <laughs> creating combinations and then allowing them to kind of show us who's, who's moving boats and who's not. Mm -hmm. And, and, and then it's not so much of who's not, it's just who's more developed at it, right? That they're going to be some that naturally are better at it than others. But that I have a group of 16 on a regular basis or maybe even kind of moving some guys from the lower boats in and out here or there. But you get a group that you know, like everyone's competent. No one's, there's no one person that's holding back kind of rhythm or dynamic. It's just everybody's you know, kind of working and going and we get really productive practices out of it because you, every time you go out too, it's not, well, I'm in the varsity and you're in the JV, so I should always be ahead because I'm in the varsity and I should always beat you by this much. Mm -hmm. It's always, hey, we're in even boats. 
We're just going out to do a workout. And actually, if we start doing some competitive stuff, there is no this boat should win or this boat should win. It's who's going to do it today. Yeah. And so sort of that um, sort of fresh outlook every time they go out versus this static, well, we're already boated up and things kind of get stale. It's just, for whatever reason, I think, A, people always want to have a training partner. So boats next to each other, when you really get used to it, 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 they get more out of it. They push one another subtly, right? Like, yeah. you know, because you're doing drills and one boat starts to get ahead doing six by drills and the other boat's like, nah, you know, and they just start working a little bit harder, you know, and if they start doing things like too hard or whatever, then you call them back. You say, listen, you should be able to run stride for stride, but not, don't jack the rate up four beats. Now you're just, you're defaulting, your default response now to a little bit of competitiveness is wrong. You're just trying to spin your wheels versus actually figuring out how to take a little bit more powerful stroke. Right. So there's the lesson, right? There. Okay, and you know, I'd rather have them learn that while they're doing steady state and drills and kind of figure that out in a calmer environment than every time they go out to race and they're falling behind and now I, I'm supposed to be rowing at 32, that's our groove, and now we go to 38 and then we're just spinning our wheels and rowing because that's their default response to being next to someone or being a seat down or being a seat ahead. And, and we would talk to the crews a lot, you know, when they're side by side. And, and first comment, and, and I touched on this with Laura the other day when we were talking about for the coxswains of having mm-hmm. those two boats side by side, yeah. it's going to develop their steering skills, right? Mm-hmm. If they're constantly mm-hmm. in a place where they have to keep two boats parallel, mm-hmm. um, then it's going to develop the same skills that they need to, to steer down a straight course when you don't have buoys available. Right. And so for anybody, the 99% of us that don't have buoy courses to practice on, you that's such a critical skill for the coxswains. Um, but, and then taking that back and saying, okay, well, you know, in the timing and, and I would like you to touch on the timing because there's so much of this that I'm hoping that the, the athletes themselves will listen to, right. Beyond the coaches and say, you know, and, and you, the timing of when you use this and you were just talking about mixed lineups throughout your competitive season, mm-hmm. still rolling a lot of by six. And so getting, getting you to kind of like in these seasons where, you know, I know at Essex where we, the eight was getting third and first at districts and should also be noting is that the second and third varsity in every year was always medalist for those years. And there were only years mm-hmm. through Essex where that was happening. And so yeah. this, these weren't just exceptional 1B athletes. This was a team that was fast. Yeah. But when did you stop rolling by sixes? when did you start to row consistently <laughs> in the lineup that you were that you yeah were because um, i think that will blow most people away i i mean i'm trying to think even this past season like i i i i get and i understand the athlete sometimes saying well if we're not in our lineup like we haven't been in our lineup like we can't and i think convincing them of that sometimes maybe when they don't know it is a little bit tough but it's more of the the more I kept forcing them to kind of go back and forth like you'd be boated up for a few days and you go back to even you go boated up like and it just became normal <clears throat> then they wouldn't worry about like I have to be in my lineup the whole time they mm-hmm. just know that and then it was like when we se- we separate into lineups and then things obviously when we got it right, <laughs> which we didn't always right away, but when we got it right, the one boat would move away from the other boat and then people would realize like, okay. And, you know, and then maybe we'd start to, okay, now you're doing competitive work where you're staggering your starts or doing different things to make it competitive, you know, while you're in boated up lineups. But, um, I, I mean, really it wasn't until the end, right? You know what I mean? Because I, I feel like, it, you know, if the idea is to peak at, our championship event, our qualifier for a national championship right now as a, you know, as a varsity college coach. <clears throat> so everything up to that point, sure, we might start racing in mid-March, but if we're not peaking until mid-May, we have to keep doing the things that work for us that were really good. So rowing and even lineups and always going back to fundamentals and spending time just, you know, sort of, okay, yeah, you know, we want to go out and do five by 1500 today, but instead of just jumping right into it, we're going to spend the first 45, 50 minutes going through drills and warm ups and things that allow us to, you know, kind of dial in the lineup that morning and get everybody awake and going and, you know, all the things that we do. 
so that then that work is quality work, mm -hmm. you know, versus, right, well, we only need 20 minutes, we're just gonna jam right through it, and we're not gonna do any work together, kind of side by side, kind of just swinging and cruising and kind of getting awake and stretched out. And so, uh, you know, I didn't, I wasn't, you know, for me to spend a, more than a week fully boated up was sort of a big thing these last few years. Like, we just, we didn't need to, and it, it became part of who we are, right, to sort of mix and match. and constantly especially like in my top two and then my assistant coach be taking kind of the next two eights if you know especially if we were that deep it's like <clears throat> constantly working with one another to kind of get better right and 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 using especially if maybe in early in the week we we're doing maybe sort of slightly longer pieces still sub race cadence by the time we got to the more dialed in stuff like okay this is shorter race pace pieces with full start thing then we'd be more in our lineups to really work on those nuances that you mm -hmm. would get but if we're doing stuff that's let's say et we're doing two milers at you know 26 28 and we want to just kind of have two boats kind of going at it and getting good work like even lineups even lineups even lineups like we just because it's just rowing and moving the boat, you know, yeah. just rowing well, moving the boat, being in rhythm, you know, and, and it's not necessarily the fine tune things of, okay, well in this lineup and we're trying and, and the varsity can, you know, get off at this and their start might be 15 strokes to then tech, like there might be some tweaks between the two boats once they get in their lineups, but mm -hmm. we're not worried about those tweaks when we're doing, you know, like AT or sub rate, like, so why not go to, you know, kind of more even stuff because I just, I felt like we got a lot out of it. And, and I think this is sort of the, you know, this does touch back onto kind of where we started with culture stuff where, you know, what I would try and say to guys is, well, this is who we are, right? This is what we do. This is what makes us like our personality, our character, our, you know, culture. Like we're going to do a lot of work in even boats and we're going to do it because we feel it's really valuable and they see the value in it and, and you know, again, maybe when we first started doing it, guys didn't understand, but the more we did it, the more they started to understand and see the value in it and see how it helped. And if, you know, and especially like, hey, you know, sort of one boat's going, the other boat's not, not to be afraid to sort of mix them back up. And it doesn't, and sort of not worry about, well, okay, the varsity's going, the JV's not, like we don't want to mess up the varsity. The varsity's big enough to kind of handle it and break back down, help mm -hmm. the JV kind of get going a little bit and then put them back in line. Now both boats are going. It, you know, and then it would happen the other way around too. Like varsity struggling, can't be the JV. JV's going. JV realizes, okay, we're gonna sort of break back down to kind of jump start and kind of get. You know, maybe we're just stuck for a day or two in a bad rut. You know, mm -hmm. we're just a little clunky today. We're sort of not rhythmic. You know, okay, well, what's what's going rhythmic in this boat? Let's break it back down. Let's spread out <laughs> the rhythm a little bit and rebuild, um, and then put them back. You know, and then divide back in lineups and do it up. So I, it's hard for me to say like, okay, well, you only you know, you do it on this day. But I would say like a Monday, Tuesday would be probably, you know, of a six days, you know, heading towards race day. Monday, Tuesday would be even lineups. Wednesday, depending on where we were and what the workout was, we might boat up, we might lap. Definitely by Thursday, you know, I'd sort of give them two days in the lineup before race day. Mm -hmm. but that's, they needed more than one. But sometimes two was was enough. It's all they needed, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to then go out and kind of execute on race day and do the things and really find out like, okay, how, how's our base speed? How are our fundamentals? How are we, yeah, we might not have all the bells and whistles right now because it's early April, but how are the build the base building blocks of our race plan starting to come together? Mm -hmm. You know, so that then over time, then okay, maybe later in the spring, you know, now it's last two weeks and, you know, for us, then we're going through exams and things like that where it's, we need to be boated up because we got to figure out who can come to practice at what time. And, right. you know, uh, but so it's really only the last few weeks, mm -hmm. you know, and then even, you know, in my years, you know, training for the IRA, the last couple of years, you know, we have like, you know, two or three weeks to go to a national championship. You know, I treat it as almost like a mini season. Like let's go back to the basics, you know, for the first week, you know, kind of scale the work back a little bit in terms of not a lot of race pace stuff, <clears throat> plenty of miles, even boats, sixes, drilling and rebuild you know, kind of repeat, rebuild over those versus try and just sustain, sustain, sustain. I think, again, you kind of, you're sort of spinning your wheels, like take them back to what they know, the things that we do kind of bread and butter all year long mm -hmm. and they get, you know, kind of calm and in a groove and then we can kind of build them back up, you know? So I, I think ultimately at Essex, you know, there was sort of the flip side of, hey, we 
one way to kind of build our numbers and kind of increase the size of the program, which we wanted to do, mm -hmm. is <clears throat> to do things more group oriented and be careful not to kind of split off the more experienced guys right away and have the younger guys really kind of languish, whether it's not having a more experienced coach with them or not being around more experienced athletes more often, or then they might not stick with it. And so, you know, sort of spending more time in even boats and doing things to kind of allow those really young guys to develop because I think a lot with juniors is junior boys and junior girls too, the amount of development they can have from like one month to the next, they're still growing so yeah, much physically, crazy. like the amount of develop, like, and so you just never know. So you, you can't just because in, you know, October you think, uh, Jimmy's too small. He's not strong enough. He's never going to get there. All of a sudden, two months later, it's a completely different, <laughs> completely different kid. And yeah. you're like, whoa, what happened? You know, the, yeah. Jimmy's six inches. Yeah. Taller. Right. Six <laughs> inches taller, put on 20 pounds. All of a sudden has all the confidence in the world, like just something happens, right? And so you just, I think you never know. And if this is the group you have, like you got to develop them. Like you can't, you can't get sort of too ahead of yourself and say, well, I've only got these, you know, seniors and these are my only guys with a good erg score. So I'm only going to focus on them, you know, and, and try and go to them and understand like, listen, you need, you might not think it, but you need them. You mm -hmm. need them to develop and you have to help them develop. And it will pay back. It will pay dividends. It's not going to right now <clears throat> in the fall, beginning of the year, mm -hmm. beginning of a spring even, but it will pay dividends towards the end. Um, and I think that's where you got to get lucky and have, you know, some athletes that get it, that have patience, are willing to be coached and taught. And you don't always get that. You get some ones that are stubborn. and right. um, But hopefully if you have... A group that's heading in the right way the stubborn ones kind of go all right well either i kind of sort of adapt and join in or maybe this isn't the sport for me right and that happens too right you know mm -hmm. people realize like hey this just if this is what we do and how we do it we'd love to have you here but if it's also not right for you then it's not right for you you may there may be something else for your athletic outlets that's better than what we're we're doing as you know trying to do rowing and team boats and things like that and for that team, there's something that there's a almost a, a plague in youth rowing or a tendency in youth rowing to uh, retreat from competitive categories. And that's something that, that you brought in. <laughs> it was never a question. We were always on the same page and yep. nobody following you and Carl, who is you know, a yep. premise of yours could buy in, you know, and it was really just kind of dragging people, you know, by uh, the cuff of their shirt into this idea of, of focusing on the eight and certainly brought it from high school, but or you brought it from your yes. college experience, yes. but it drives me crazy um, at the youth level of this retreating from competitive categories to qualify boats for a national level competition or <laughs> to be more competitive. And when I look at the district results, mm -hmm. And there's, it was like a completely different regatta where there was, there was zero competitiveness in the eights beyond those first three, four spots. Um, and then there's just these boats racing in the, uh, in the fours from programs that might be four eights deep on the varsity side yeah. and they're thrown in these fours. And I think that, and I would love to hear your perspective and reasoning because when you came in, it was clear that it was an eights program. We weren't going into fours. You know, we may hop in and race a four, right? But we were never going to get halfway through the spring season. Say we're not happy with our results. Let's see how we are on the eight. You know, and I think that was key for your success in the eight. You know, sure. and later on, when that when that line was held, that also produced success in the eight in future years where coaches wanted to repeat <laughs> the four and the line was drawn and, and you know for me certainly as a senior coach saying you must focus on the eight and then suddenly success coming out of that eight. yeah uh, so I I think you know especially when we look at it you know uh, obviously from the Essex standpoint and you know from from day one you and I were like okay we have the resources meaning the equipment the coaching to run big boats um, we feel we have either we have close to or we can recruit and find the numbers to run 
bigger boats. You know, it's not as if we're saying, hey, listen, we're in a, an area where we're lucky to have 10 athletes and maybe rowing an eight isn't as smart all the time in just one boat as smart as going out in two fours. Mm-hmm. You know, and having that dynamic we've been talking about of, you know, sort of like training, training next to someone and competitiveness and so on. So obviously part of the focus in on the eight was we felt we had the ability to do it, the area we were in, the resources that we already had in the club. And I think we also thought about it in terms of if we're going to keep growing the club and we want to have more athletes and we want to expand the roster size, you know, short of rowing uh, octopedes, right? You you know, I mean, rowing the eight was the way to do it. Mm -hmm. And that, and then I think also from the athlete development standpoint, like if I'm the athlete and I'm going, all right, well, I have a chance to be, you know, there's, if there's a varsity and a JV and they're both going well and I want to, like there's 16 spots versus it's just a bunch of doubles and so I've got to be one of two people. Mm-hmm. You know, here I am one of 20 athletes on the team, but the top boats, the priority ones are, you know, two doubles. So I've got to be one of those four people and they kind of get discouraged before they even give themselves a chance. Yeah. And so I think there's that, you know, that, you know, in terms of like, well, how do you retain your athletes? Well, if you, you know, bigger boats is more opportunities and you know, everybody realizes like, Hey, people are at different levels in their skill sets. So, but still like it's an eight and I might make it. Right. I don't, I might not be the best guy, but I might make it, you know, mm-hmm. and I, I think the, the other piece, so I think that's more of a, you know, sort of internal in terms of just how do you build your group? But I think sort of that, I think where you're really going with this was the, okay, as a club program and we go to our regionals and we want to be competitive in our region and we want to kind of move on. Like <laughs> if you want to be successful in the eight, then you have to row the eight. You can't. And, and all year you have to commit to rowing the eight, even if you're not good enough to qualify. Again, this is me, this is my philosophy, right? So, and versus you start rowing the eight and then you're not sure whether how far you're gonna go or if you're fast enough right away. And so immediately you say, all right, well, you start hedging your bets and you say, mm-hmm. we're gonna break down into fours or pairs or something else. And you start breaking into smaller things. And so I think that the, the tough part there is What's the message you're sending as a coach to them about persevering in the face of adversity if as soon as things get maybe a little bit uncertain in terms of results, as a coach, you go, that's it, I'm scrapping the eight, I'm going to go into four, so I'm going to the small boats. Yeah, and what it's saying to that second four Right, (laughs) right, because those athletes go, I've been trying all the time, they've been telling me all you're this, and then they just completely change, Mm -hmm. you know, the end goal on me, and like, why why am I doing this if I'm going to get you know, bumped up. Yeah, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to invest in this <laughs> right. And then three weeks into the season, right. all of a sudden I'm on the 2B. Right. And, you know, not because somebody's taken my spot, but simply because my spot right. disappeared as a real, as an option. And, and I, so I feel like, you know, it's, we could qualify in the four. We think we might have four guys. But if we want to kind of build a long-term eights program, mm-hmm. we're not going to get there if we shy away in a year where we think things are tougher. Because... You know, if, if we stick with the eight and we row it all the way to the end and we find out like, okay, you row it all the way in the best you can and you go to your region, let's say, and you figure out, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm third or fourth. I just missed qualifying and I'm five seconds back. Well, that's the conversation to have over the next year. Like how do we, we're trying to kind of move, we're trying to see, be a better version of us next year. Can we move five seconds in a year? Yeah, it's about, a, you know, maybe it's a boat length and a half. Can we do that? Yeah, we think we can do that. You know, and it might be one thing if you're 30 seconds back and you're like, okay, and then it might be a more longer term thing. But I think there's a lot of value in maybe you're not sure, you go, you follow through, you come up a little bit short, and then you use that as motivation. That becomes part of the story and the motivation for your next group about how you build. You know, and, and, people, and then the athletes understand like, hey, we're going to, we're committing this no matter what. And if we fall up short, then, you know, it's like life. Hey, if we fell short of our goal, what do we do? What are we going to do when we get our next opportunity? Are we going to just sort of hold our hands and go, we're not good enough? Or are we actually going to try and get better? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, and I think that was a big part of it, right? Like the guys knew like, hey, this is what we're going to do. We'll race smaller boats as a way to just get some more racing experience and supplement our ability to build our eights. But we're going to try and build our eights. And, you know, we got kind of pretty lucky first year we started to qualify and then like okay that first year we went 
to youth nationals and we didn't do very well because we were sort of first time there were a lot of fast teams and it was like very eye-opening mm -hmm. but that experience when we had a bunch of guys returning next year allowed us to race the next year at a much higher level because they weren't overwhelmed by it like they had been okay we got beat up a little bit first time next year we were a lot more savvy about it we kind of knew we also knew like hey just because we're sort of good in our region wow there's a lot of other regions out there and so if we want to be better and there's sort of that natural instinct, like let's, can we get another rung up the ladder? Can we move just one step higher up the ladder and maybe finish here and, you know, C final instead of D final or B final instead of C final. And, you know, sort of that, that energy to me starts to feed on itself, but only if from the coaching standpoint or from the top, you say, you, you've got to stick with it. Even if, okay, there's a year we don't go, you know what I mean? Like, okay, we weren't good enough this year. We don't get to go. Like, I do think that's a really valuable lesson. How, how else are they going to learn, you know, when it's like, well, if we're good, we'll go. But otherwise, I'm going to be in the four. And so why am I pushing myself and my right. teammates to get better when I'm just going to go in the four anyways? Yeah. And, you know, we saw it a lot in terms of the culture is, is that, you know, that four would start to separate itself from the other group. And yes. then when the four was in the eight, Mentally, it was right. like, well, why are we in this eight with these other guys? And it became a very fractured yes. culture as yes. a result of that. Yes. Whereas if it was simply a matter of even going in and saying, well, our focus is the force, you know, right. then you wouldn't have had that same because then the second fastest right. guys know that their, their goals, they're pushing the, the first four. pass and the third ones are pushing the second one. Right. Exactly. You can create that cohesive culture, but obviously when you start kind of hedging your bets or sort of changing the end goal, yeah, you know, kind of halfway around right, right. mid season or halfway yeah. through your spring season, you're right. It fractures your culture. Why are we rolling? This isn't, if this isn't what we're going to do, we shouldn't care about these guys and it's not right. So all that hard work you put into trying to get one culture out of your varsity group, whatever it is, now you've sort of set yourself back, you know, and that's, and <laughs> why would you do that? Yeah. I mean, I guess, you know, that's just something philosophically I didn't, I didn't believe in, even though, you know, that first year I didn't know if we were going to qualify in the eight or I had no idea, you know, like I was like, all right, well, I have an idea of what the college speed is like, but I have no idea right now, first year in, like, well, what is the speed of junior boys eights in this region? I don't know how, like, you know, there was, it was all new and it made it fun and exciting. And, you know, again, it's something that then guys got, I think, behind, mm -hmm. you know, that they knew that that was, we were going to commit to that as a group, coaching staff, athletes, boathouse, like, this is what we want to do. And if we fall short, we fall short. And then we move on. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's, there's two things I want to touch on there is one and, and kind of giving credit to those coaches that do make those decisions that there is going to be a lot of political pressure, especially from the <laughs> parents, especially from the funding. You know, there are programs out there where it's like your goal is to send boats to nationals. It's not develop this team culture. But hopefully through this conversation, you know, my goal would be to kind of let those coaches hear the thought process behind it and, and the value that that consistent goal setting can have to the culture and the long term and if they can hear that and understand that and buy into that idea then perhaps they can sell that to to that wherever those political pressures are whether it's the parents that are wanting to see boats go to nationals or whether it's from board members or, or funders saying hey we want to get as many boats to nationals <clears throat> right. versus saying having a coach say look it's it's vital for the for the strength of the culture and the long-term development of this team to say this is our goal. It's okay to fall short of that goal one year as long as we keep that long-term focus. Right. So, you know, you sort of say, all right, if the goal is to send boats to nationals, you say, all right, well, you know, at what cost? Mm -hmm. You know, so if you're sort of not not maybe kind of fully buying in to develop your kind of broad-based team culture and you're just waiting to see kind of which way the wind's going to blow you, like, hey, it looks like the pair event's going to be a good one this year. It's sort of a weak field. We can qualify to that one. Or, hey, we think the four event. And then you're creating, I think you're self-perpetuating. You know, if if you start doing that as a club or a program, well, of course the parents are going to th sort of start giving you more feedback on that because they're just following what you're doing. They're mm -hmm. like, well, yeah, but you started the eight this year, but last year you did this, so how come we're not doing it the year? And it, like... Versus if you start out and you say, and, and kind of very clear up front from the very beginning when it's sort of far enough away where you're saying, this is what we're going to do, no, no sense or bust, because we feel like if we develop the team culture and we do it the right way, mm -hmm. 
over time, we're going to consistently send boats to nationals. Yeah. So we're going to get to the goal, but we got to do this first and kind of believe in it. And then that's what's, that's our ticket to get there on a consistent basis, not just a, well, one year we make it one year, you know, you're just sort of, you know, whatever you can that year to sort of, you know, it's like you're grasping at straws. And then I think you'll get buy-in from your board, your parents, whatever saying, Oh, this is who we are. This is how we do this. And they understand it from the get go. We're not like, this is how we're, how we're doing it here. And then you wouldn't see them questioning it as much or being it because they understand like, this is how we set it out from the beginning. This is what we're going to do. We recognize that these other things can go on. I mean, I think you need to sort of address it up front and say, yes, we know we can do this, but we're not going to. And here's why. Um, you know, or you are having the conversation saying, you know what, maybe we should be a force program, seven eights program, right? Mm-hmm. We need to actually reevaluate and this is the better way. And now we're going to develop it this way, but then we're going to be consistent with it. And then I think you probably, it allows you to maybe minimize some of those political things that do crop up. Mm-hmm. You know, why is my son or daughter here, here? <clears throat> why are we spending money on this and not this? You know, I'm a, you know, I'm an avid supporter. I'm, you know, funding your thing. Why aren't we? Right. You know, I think you have to be as transparent as you can and communicate as well as you can with those groups to understand like this is our this is our philosophy, this is our plan. And so you kinda like anything, right? You gotta have a plan. Right. And you've got to be willing to stick to the plan and you've got to be willing to, you know, take maybe short term setback for long term. You know, because that's the way I've always looked at it. It's like, hey, I'm trying to build something for the long term. It's never about how do I just make the most out of this year and we'll figure out next year when we get to it. It's always how do we how do we do things that, yeah, okay, we get the most out of this year, but we're always setting ourselves up for, you know, success down the line. We're always looking at it as, you know, building towards the future as well. And, you know, in terms of figuring out what that goal is, and, you know, a kind of a benchmark that I always took into it was, if you have three boats of something, make that your focus, you know, and I don't know if there's, there's other ways, but for me, it was, if you can, if you can float three eights every day at practice, make the eight your focus. Right. If you can't, then maybe make the four your focus, right. you know, is if you have a program, they can float two eights consistently every day. Should the eight be that focus? Should the four be that focus? You know, where is there a line? You know, right. Is there yeah. Or should it be quads? Or? Should we be, yeah, right. Yeah. Should we be scaling? I Yeah. And I think. I think there's definitely something to be said there. And then you got to look at it and you go, all right, well, is our roster this year, is this a one-year thing Mm -hmm. that we just kind of got caught (laughs) in low numbers? And, hey, we stick to our path on the eight, even though we've only got 12 guys, let's hold to it. Yeah. And maybe we are still training in three fours a lot Mm -hmm. (laughs) to create training environment. We're still racing the eight and present it because we know we build these guys, everyone feels involved, engaged, they all keep returning and we get the next new group of guys and now we're back to having our two eights plus that we need. You know, is it a... Mm -hmm. Is it a one-year setback, maybe, if you don't have the numbers you're looking for? Or is this, you know, who we are as a club, that we're a smaller club and really don't have the numbers to sustain? Right. Yeah, I think tracking that long-term. And, you know, certainly as a program director, you've got to consider the equipment, you know, in there as well. Mm -hmm. And I know for us, eights were the cheapest boat, you know, to fund on a per-seat basis. Eights were the cheapest coat to coach, you know, on a a per-coach basis. You know, logistically, if you can manage those roster sizes, that that the eight is kind of your your budget decision. You know, and the four, you know, in the same way, like you know, if it, if the team is dropping down from having three or four eights one season, two years later you're down to an eight and a four. You know, saying okay, well, there's there's also the equipment acquisition question of all right, are we going to shift our focus, or are we going to kind of push through these harsh times and try to kind of get back to where we were? You know, and work with what we have. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and you and I would go through that, you know, quite a bit, you know, in terms of <laughs> what equipment do we, we have? What do we want to have in an ideal world if our budget was unlimited mm-hmm. or less limited than it is, you know, what would we do? And then what, you know, if we knew we were getting 15 novices every year, do we put them all in quads and teach them all sculling so that then maybe by the time then we have a bigger group, we may not, we're not going to run, you know, eight quads. We're trying to run eights, you know, like... Mm-hmm. You know, is there maybe a slightly different philosophy to, you know, what you do when they're younger versus when they're older, which is, you know, I think an age old, you know, juniors question, you know, we know how European countries do it. It's really about sculling and not sweeping. And it's, I think, why we find ourselves behind, you know, sort of internationally at the higher levels at U23s or whatever in the sculling events, 
even though obviously there's there's a lot been a lot of change to that you know in the last five to ten years where there are a lot more really good sculling programs out there in the U.S. that are doing well and kind of moving you know yeah. moving athletes along that are you know ending up in you know the sculling events and, and, I think and for, doing well. I think you know when when people are talking about that, I, I think people don't. I think people focus on the technical side and developmental side of the value of teaching sculling at an early age and using that as a, as a mm-hmm. stepping stone for mm-hmm. moving to sweep. You know, and I don't think we certainly have the time to dive into it here, but commenting on the fact that there's a logistical question there that I think people don't appreciate. And I think a lot of, I'll hear a lot of coaches talk about, well, sculling is so important. We should have all our young rowers sculling that don't grasp the logistical challenge of, I have a team with 36 athletes and you want me to teach them all how to scull. How do you want me to accomplish that in terms of storage, in terms of equipment acquisition, in terms of more important, the coaching, you know, that and safety. You can, yeah. And safety. And that ties into the coaching of like, okay, well, yeah, I can agree with you that these novices would benefit from learning how to scull and all being proficient single scholars before we talk about the eight, but you're telling me that you want me to manage 24, you know, 30 novice scholars, you know, in singles and doubles, you know, with this one coach that it would have taken to coach that those, those same 24 athletes and two eights, you know, with some spares. Um, and so, you know, kind of putting out there for people, you know, and that's a conversation I definitely want to kind of have with, with other people and, you know, more on kind of the program administration side, but, uh, something to think about and, and yeah, that needs to be and it's something that obviously there are at the junior level, there are those opportunities, there are those events and sculling, you know, we're, we're sitting here right now as, you know, youth nationals are going on and, mm-hmm. you know, you've got all those great programs from across the country that are racing at a really really competitive level and yet obviously when you get to the collegiate level it doesn't exist Mm -hmm. it's all about you know the eights and you know that's what our national championships about whether it's you know iras or ncaa's or acros like everybody's national championships are in the big boats Mm -hmm. so how do you as a junior program feed into that you know sort of model and mentality of if i want to continue rowing at the collegiate level if I want to use you know if I want rowing to be part of my life as a collegiate student you know I've I've got to be ready for competing in sweet boats mm-hmm. um, yeah I, I think I think you and I both know that there's a little, everybody's approaching it differently right. but I, I but I you know and I would always dive in as like because you know as you know most of the time I was coaching sculling you mm-hmm. know, we would kind of move back and forth because I was you know I dealt with a lot of kind of roster size in, a, in an awkward place of kind of the mid teens to yep. to low 20s and, and and deciding what was the best serving for those groups but um, you know I hear a lot of talk about that well we're, we, we don't want to be sculling because we're racing in eights in college so we need experience in eights or well, sculling will give us good small boats will give us good fundamentals, so we got to focus on that and not on the eights. You know, and I think that I think that neither of those arguments kind of hold water. I think that you need it that they're you need to learn the dynamics of moving a boat. You know, and I don't think I, I think that the that the subtleties are small enough between those two boat classes or those two different styles that you can learn what you need in one boat class and the other. And that I think people get too fixated on what they should be doing early to prepare for what they're doing later. I think that 95% of those things that you're learning that are gonna be the same in both of those, you know, and that those 5% of the little nuances are not important to, to be like, well, I have to be practicing an eight if I wanna race in an eight. Oh, I have to be sculling if I'm gonna be sculling later. I, I think right. that within the season, certainly focus on where your sure. goal is. But from the developmental side, you know, certainly from high school people going to, to college, you know, and we'll see it a lot in, in the summer, you know, when the athletes are like, well, what do I want to do this summer? It's like, well, you know, I know there's a sculling program here, but I need to be learning how to sweep or, you know, we're sweeping here, but I need to get some small boat skills because that's what's important. Um, I think it's, you know, develop the fundamentals, understand how a boat moves, understand how leverage works and how you influence that. Yeah, I, I think... You know, one way for me to look at that as a college coach is, you know, you go, okay, well, you know, what are college people like myself, what are college coaches looking for, mm-hmm. right? Is and, and meaning, are we just because someone's a scholar, is that better 
is that going to translate better you know to being a, a collegiate oarsman or is it better because this person's in this you know AIDS program and I think you know to me it's more of what type of athlete is this person doesn't matter whether they've been sweeping or sculling doesn't matter whether they row all summer or not like you know in other words if this person says to me if I'm recruiting someone like well you know what I row in the spring for my school and then um, you know I'm really into biking and um, running and I actually do triathlons in the summer Mm -hmm. and I'm thinking to myself this person likes being an athlete they're a really good athlete right they're a well-rounded athlete that's to me that's engaging to coach that person right they're trying to be an athlete you know, so, and this is where I agree, whether you're in a sculling boat or a sweep boat, you know, you're trying to figure out how to move boats. You're trying to figure out how to be more athletic, more dynamic. It's not, it, it doesn't matter whether it's sweep or scull. You're trying to be, how do you understand your body better? <laughs> Sleep, nutrition, all the things that go in as a young athlete, like figuring out the whole thing, not just, did I spend a lot of time in a sweep boat so I'm more comfortable you know, rowing on port side or whatever it is versus I spend all my time rowing in a quad. Mm-hmm. You know, to me, that, that doesn't necessarily make you a better or worse college athlete. Someone who's obviously been athletic, maybe plays multiple sports even. I think there are a lot of people that think that's a bad idea, right? Like they should specialize, specialize, specialize. I don't know if I agree with that. I think, you know, people that are, you know, have the ability to, multiple sports you're getting someone with a higher level of athleticism better hand body coordination all those things that's going to make them a better you know better athletes are better athletes yeah you know and and what coach wouldn't want to work with athletes that are more developed how they develop there's a lot of ways Mm -hmm. there's a myriad of ways it doesn't have to be just this just that or i have to row 12 months a year if someone's you know, a swimmer that then run like there's a lot of ways. Certainly, I think probably people that are more on the endurance side of things, that that type of physiology takes time to develop. So someone who started developing that in college, let's say, versus someone who, if they just played football, mm-hmm. okay, they might be strong and they might be fairly coordinated, but maybe they're missing some of that aerobic component that it's going to take some time to develop. You know, you pick someone up that's a swimmer, a runner, uh, you know, a cyclist or whatever. You know, all of a sudden. The, their understanding of that endurance side of our sport is much, you know, they're much further along, they're much more advanced. And you're like, it's just stuff in a lot of ways you can't coach. Like they either have it or don't. And then it just takes time, you know, for them to develop it. So getting a head start on that through other ways, of, like that's the key, right? Finding those people that are just good all around athletes versus someone who's been <clears throat> rowing a lot, but not really kind of evolving in their athleticism you know might they might be a little bit limited yeah stale yeah well i think we're good mike yeah i appreciate the conversation thank you my pleasure always good to talk shop awesome love it all right